right. Well, good morning, Discover. It's great to see you all here. What a beautiful day uh, to be together in the house of the Lord. Uh, excited to be here. Excited to start a new series. Um, so will you sing with us this morning? In the secret, in the quiet place. In the stillness, you are there. In the secret, in the quiet hour, I wait only for you. Because I want to know you more. I want to know you. I want to know you. I want to hear your voice. I want to know you more. I want to touch you. I want to see your face. And I want to touch you. I want to see your face. I want to know you more. I am reaching for the highest goal. I am reaching for the highest goal that I might receive his prize. That I might receive your prize. Pressing onward. Pressing onward. Pushing every hindrance aside out of my way. Because I want to know you more sing this together i want to know you and i want to know you i want to hear your voice i want to know you more and i want to touch you i want to see your face I want to know you more. Sing, I want to know you. And I want to know you. I want to hear your voice. I want to know you more. I want to touch you. And I want to touch you. I want to see your face. I want to know you more. Let's sing that together. We sing, I want to know you. And I want to know you. I want to hear your voice. I want to know you more. I want to touch you. I want to see your face. I want to touch you. I want to see your face. I want to know you more. Because I want to know you more. Because I want to know you more. Amen, amen. That's our prayer this morning. Uh, take a few minutes, get some coffee. Scott will be up in just a minute. Am I okay there, Jeremy? Hi, everybody out there. Good morning. Those of you watching from home. Everybody here in the room? Hey, good to see you all. I'm a little nervous today. Just want you to know this. We could not find the little tape that we use to mark the floor where I'm supposed to stand. Uh, somehow it disappeared last week. So, um, you know, it's kind of like my anchor to like, no, okay, here's, here's where I am. I'm not supposed to move. And so I'm feeling like 
Yeah, you know? <laughs> like a rudderless boat out at sea. But anyway, we'll just make it. And I apologize to you. If you're watching online, see, it's really for you guys that I have to do this. You guys, I could be all over the place. But for you guys, I need to stay here. If I, if I move, I'm sorry. Just hear me apologize for that right now. But uh, everybody else... Good to have you here today. Good to see your faces. And uh, you know that the Bible says today is the day that the Lord has made. And then he says that we should be glad and rejoice in it. And I really hope that you're doing that this morning. Uh, we are going to start a brand new series today that I'm very excited about. And before we get into it very far, I'd like to ask you if you would say a word of prayer with me. Father God, we thank you so much for bringing us here today. We do want to know you more. We want to touch your face. We want to feel your touch in our lives. And so, God, I just ask that we would be blessed by that now. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would move in our midst and that you would draw us to you no matter where we are, if we're in the room or if we're watching from home or wherever, maybe an airport, who knows, Lord, that you know where we are and you've got us in your grip. And I just pray that we would feel you move. Uh, Lord God, I pray that the things that we look at today would just be um, powerful in our lives, God. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, today we are starting a brand new series called Wars and Rumors. And uh, this is a series <clears throat> that I have been kicking around literally for years. We've been saying, okay, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going we're gonna to do this. I mean, Jeremy can attest to this. I think, I mean, uh, Jeremy was in high school when we started talking about doing a series on prophecy. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's been one we thought for a long time, oh, we need to do this, we need to do one, we need to do one. And probably like a lot of you, when COVID hit, and all of a sudden we started realizing this was like a global pandemic that was beginning to happen, I kind of thought, man, is this, is this in times? Does, does, the Bible, does the Bible refer to this at all, you know? But then, you know, being the history guy, I started kind of giving it some thought. And I thought, well, you know, last century, we had the Spanish flu. And that, unfortunately, killed a lot more people than COVID seemed to be killing. And then, hey, you know, I mean, if you really want to go through, you know, the big deep dive on history, the Black Plague, you know, back in the, the Dark Ages was obviously even more, you know, horrific. And the world never ended with regard to either one of those plagues. So, you know, I mean, it's okay, right? It's, 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 all, it's all right. I mean, because, I mean, are we supposed to look at the extent of a catastrophe to judge whether or not it's, you know, has some kind of a biblical impact on us? Or is it something else that we should be looking at? Because you see, here's the interesting thing. The Black Plague and obviously the Spanish flu, those things happened before May of 1948. And COVID, which is happening today, obviously happened after May of 1948. And you see, May the 14th, 1948, when you start talking about biblical prophecy, that day is not just any old day in human history. When it comes to the Bible and prophecy, that day has really unique significance. Now, Karen is already smiling at me. Does anybody else besides Karen, and she doesn't get to call, I'm going to call on her if nobody else knows. Does anybody else know what the significance of May 14th, 1948 is? What happened on that day? Wayne, what happened on that day? Israel became a nation. Israel reformed as a nation. And that begins to change things a little bit. That begins to sort of affect things because in a prophetic sense, that's a big deal. Most people, I think, have an awareness that there is prophecy in the Bible. But most people also think, well, there's prophecy in the Bible, but, you know, there's doctrine in the Bible and there's history in the Bible. There's even poetry in the Bible. And when it comes to those other Things, those other types of scriptures that are contained within the Bible, a lot of us have said, you know, I'm, I'm not, I, I kind of know what's going on with, with doctrine, and I kind of know what's going on with history. I'm comfortable with those. And even with regard to, to 
the poetry aspect of the Bible and the life lessons that are equated with, with the poetry. I have a, a comfort level with those and a familiarity with those that I don't necessarily have with prophecy. And I'm okay with that. I've been historically okay with that. And when I say I and we, I'm being intentional. I would lump myself into this group where I would say to you all, I'm part of it in thinking that, you know, it's knowledge that it's in there has been historically enough. Knowledge about what it has to say beyond the fact that it's in there has been something that, you know, is not at the front of, of, of my lobe, you know, and I would assume probably a lot of us in the room haven't worried too much about it because we're not walking around on a daily basis thinking, ah, Jesus is coming back real soon and so I, I probably should be sharp on this stuff. It hasn't been a big pressing issue until all of a sudden all of these weird, crazy things started happening. But once I think we start pondering it and looking at it, it doesn't take much to sort of notice that um, the winds of globalism tend to be blowing across this planet, that the, the beat of the war drum tends to be getting louder and louder, that there is a secularism that seems to not only be taking root, but you could even take it further than that and say there's an anti-biblical worldview that is becoming very dominant to a point where you could really start looking at all this stuff and go, is something going on? And I think personally, and maybe you'll join me in this line of thinking, that when you look at all of these things, this is a good moment for us to kick the tires and go, there needs to be something more for us individually than just an, okay, yeah, sure, there's prophecy in the Bible and I'm okay with just knowing that. I think we need to know a little bit more than just it's in there. I think we need to all understand what the significance of May the 14th, 1948 in the reformation of Israel is. I think it's a good idea for us all to know what the tribulation is, what the millennium is. I think we should know what the Battle of Armageddon is all about. I think we should know exactly what Revelation means when it talks about the bride. I think we should have a pretty good understanding of what the Antichrist is is going to do. I think it's really important that when we find ourselves coming to a day where we are hearing about wars and rumors of wars, that we're prepared for that, particularly if uh, that day may have already arrived, right? And so that's what we're going to do with this series. We're going to take a good look at uh, what the Bible has to say about the things that are to come. Now, with regard to this series, before we get too deep into it, um, I need to tell you one thing that's really important that's kind of, um, I actually need to say it emphatically, but it's something that I think you all know and you all understand, and that's this. My name is Scott, and his name is God, and as I like to say, because he is and I'm not. There are all kinds of things that I need to do in this series. As your pastor, I need to tell you what the verses in here are. I need to share them with you. I need to try to teach you about things that have happened, things that you may be aware of or things that you aren't aware of. And I think I can do that. But what I cannot do is tell you with absolute certainty what some of the stuff that we're going to read about that hasn't happened yet, what some of these things are, what's going on. Um, let me give you an example. Let me share with you something from the book of Revelation. This is Re Revelation um, chapter 9. The locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. On their heads, they wore something like crowns of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails and stings like scorpions. 
and their tails had the power to torment people for five months. What would a guy living 2,000 years ago describe a Chinese M-20 attack helicopter like? I don't know. What would a guy living today describe a giant flying locust scorpion monster like? I don't know. Can I tell you emphatically, can I tell you without doubt or hesitation or reservation that what John was describing when he was standing on the seashore 2,000 years ago in Patmos and God said, write this stuff all down, I'm going to show you what is to come. Can I tell you with certainty that what he saw was a modern military, military helicopter and he put it in his best you know, verbiage of what he was looking at 2,000 years ago? Or did he write down what he saw seeing some kind of a scary monster? I don't know. But what I can tell you definitively with absolute certainty is John saw something scary that had the power to rain down you know, horror upon people. And that's what's important that we understand. There are going to be things that we look at that we go, what in the world? What is that? That don't seemingly make sense to us. And we can try our very best with our 21st century minds to work it out in a way that, oh, I know what that is. But we don't definitively know at that level. So I think what's very best for us in this series is to take what we're going to read and to look at it and go, okay, what's certain in this? What's certain in this is, like in this passage, something scary is coming. Something scary is coming. And we need to know about it. We need to understand what it's there for. And gang, we absolutely can. The Bible makes it very clear that we can grasp something very important about prophecy. Peter shares this in uh, his both of his letters, right? actually, in both of his epistles, he makes it very clear uh, for, that there is something that we as Christ followers can know about prophecy. Let me share this with you. This is from the book of 1 Peter, his first chapter, the 10th through the 13th verses. Peter said, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Okay, that is a tough passage of Scripture. There's a lot going on there, even when we're not, you know, distracted by everything going on in our lives and, and in the room. Um, we, no, 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 not at all. Not at all, not at all. Let's break this down just a little bit, though, and make sure that we understand everything that's in this passage of Scripture. A couple of, of key things that come out of this that Peter wants to make sure that we know. The first thing that I think is really important that is revealed in this passage of Scripture happens to do with the individuals who were tasked with delivering the messages of prophecy. Those people who gave those prophecies were called prophets. And the first thing that Peter says about those prophets is that the people who are listening to him, who are reading this letter, need to remember a few things about prophets. Now, to the Jews, they had great familiarity with prophets. They had had them around for a long time. Most recently to when Peter would have written this verse down, uh, John the Baptist, who was a prophet, had been out there in the wilderness making his proclamations. And the Jews who had this great history with prophets, they, they didn't always like their prophets. Matter of fact, you could probably argue that most of the time they didn't care too much for the prophets. But the one thing that they did feel about prophets and they understood about them was they recognized they were from God. They recognized that they were God's spokespeople, for lack of a better term. And Peter, when he jumps into this passage, he knows that his audience understands that already intuitively. 
that when he starts talking about prophets, he's talking to a group of people who are going to say, know what those are and know that they're from God. So he says, that's good, that knowledge that you have, but let me make sure that I add a few things so that you grasp very, very key, very central about the prophecies that they deliver. The first one he said is that the prophets were from, excuse me, the prophecies were from God, not the prophets. He said, now this may be a no duh, but then again, <laughs> we need to make sure you get this. When a prophet tells a prophecy, that prophecy is not coming from the prophet. That prophecy has been given to the prophet by God. And now he is giving that prophecy to the people. So you need to never un underestimate this. You need to never let this little detail go. Hang on to it real tight. Which, again, you might say, well, okay, no, duh. I mean, I get that. He's, Peter says, no, it's a big one. Hang on to that. But at the same time, that, or just maybe as quickly as you're grasping that, then you also need to couple with that this next little piece of data. And that's this, that the prophecies that the prophets got were for others not for the prophets. So when the prophet would be kind of just doing whatever the prophet was doing and God would speak to that prophet and say, hey, here is my word, pass this on, that word was to be passed on to other people. The intention of that word being given to the prophet was for that word, that prophetic word, to be passed on to the people that were listening. So, very, <coughs> excuse me, very much in this case, Peter is... Uh, passing along these words. He's passing along these words, and it's to people reading his letter. And so those people reading those letters, like you and me this morning, we are supposed to understand this stuff is coming from God. It was not to Peter for Peter. It was to Peter to give to you and me. So therefore, that word is for us. That word becomes something that we, the readers of the word, are supposed to take in and look at and have in our possession, which we do, right? If we have a Bible, or we have a Bible app on our phones, we've got the prophecy. And a lot of us, as I said at the beginning of this, have been content to say, well, I know what's in there. And if we ever get to a scary place, I guess I'll break it out at that point, but I'm just going to be content to leave it in there, knowing it's there, and I know where to find it if I ever need it. Which Peter says, you can't do that. You need to go further with this. Because then he says this thing about angels, which is kind of interesting. At the end, he says, angels seek to study the prophecy. Now, we have to understand this little nugget of wisdom, this little data point, in the same context with which we've just been given these other two pieces. And that is namely, this piece is being given to us, for us, to then decipher and understand how it applies to us. In other words, if the angels of God need to seek out understanding and meaning by studying the prophecies, guess who else does? We do. Us. We should be getting it out. We should be understanding it. We should be seeking to, to see what is the meaning that I can glean from this. What is it that God is trying to communicate to me in this? You say, well, okay, that's great. But you just showed me, Scott, this prophecy about these scorpion locust monsters that may or may not be Chinese attack helicopters. What am I supposed to do with that? Well, again, I'm Scott. He's God. Let's look at what Peter had to say that came from God about what we can glean and how we can glean something. This is from his second epistle, his second letter. This is the 19th verse from the first chapter. And we have the word of the prophets made more certain. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Again, I get it. There are some verses that I'm going to share with you over the course of your life that you are letting me be a part. And you're going to say, I really don't need you, Scott, to give me a lot of interpretation on what that verse means. I've got it. But some of these verses that we're looking at, even today, you might look at and go, that's kind of some weird language. What is he trying to say there? The whole key to everything that he's saying right there in that verse is that there is a, a purpose for that scripture. It is a light 
that illuminates a dark place. That prophecy that we are supposed to study, the reason why we are supposed to study it, the reason why he wants us to get in there and wrestle with it, is so that what is dark around us can begin to become illuminated. And that's the whole point of prophecy, to show what's in front, right? I mean, that makes a lot of sense. How many of you have ever been in a dark room before and you wanted to pull out your phone, right, and flip it around and turn the phone on just so you could kind of see what's in front of you, right? Especially if you have little kids and you're walking around, right, and you're trying to navigate what they left on the floor, right? Or, you know, you have a dog like mine that's shedding all the time and it's a lot of hair and you're afraid you're going to slip, right? I mean, you know, you, you have those moments, right, where you just, you need to see that obstacle that's in front of you. Well, here's Peter saying, this is what it's about. We've been given this word of grace that is the prophecy. So we need to get in and we need to reckon that it has to be more than just something that's in our Bibles, just something that we are comfortable saying, I've got knowledge that it's there. And instead, we need to say, let me take that knowledge and let me open it up. Let me apply it. And if the angels say, man, we've got to get in and we need to, to go deeper with it. We need to wrestle with it. And if it doesn't kind of give us clarity at first, I don't throw it away and say, yeah, never mind. It's just, it's easier to read Song of Songs than it is Revelation. It's easier to go and get into the Gospels than it is Daniel. It's easier to, to mess with, you know, the doctrine and the Pauline epistles than it is to try to wrestle with, you know, all of the prophecy. So I'll stick with what's easy. No, we recognize that we have come to a place perhaps where the world around us has gotten so dark that we, we could really use some help to know what's going on here. And in that moment of clarity that God wants to give us, He's going to turn on a light with the prophecy to say, hey, let me show you something that's going to give you some insight into how this is all playing out. So it's important that we get that. It's important that we, we recognize this first stake in the ground about the importance of us studying prophecy. And then I think there's one other thing that's really important that we grasp this morning as we kind of kick this whole thing off. And that deals with a, a little bit more of the purpose of the prophecy that God has put into the Bible and, and how it is supposed to all work out in our lives. And I thought about this, I was telling Jeremy this the other day, we had staff meeting and I was, I was sharing this with him and he's like, dude, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I, this morning, Cindy is having this massive sort of green allergy attack thing that's been just sort of r ravaging her, and um, she's sneezing up all kinds of, of nasty, and, uh, and we I just was like trying to love on her for the last couple days, and, and she was real sweet this morning. She was like, I just love you, and I just appreciate you loving on me, and I was like, oh, good, pay off, right? You know, <laughs> she, she was liking that, and I was thinking, you know, over the course of our marriage, there have been all of these moments where, um, you know, birthdays or anniversaries or Christmas where I've bought her a present or a gift, and I get excited about it. I'm just one of these kind of nerds who, you know, oftentimes will find something for her that I think, oh, this is just right. This is good. She's going to love this. This is really great. And then I kind of get worked up, and I start thinking, you know, if I do this, if I get her this gift, it, she's going to open it up on our her birthday on Christmas morning, and she's going to love it. She's going to think, this is so cool. She's just going to be really, but even more than she's going to think the gift is cool, she's going to think I am cool, right? She's going to love me. She's going to go, this is so great. Thank you, honey. Right? And I start playing through these scenarios when I'm standing in line to buy the gizmo or whatever it is, right, you know? And then by the time I drive home and then by the time I get it all wrapped up, man, I am like just playing through it all in my mind and I'm so geeked up about what's gonna happen, you know, in a week or two whenever she opens it up. So guess what I do in that week or two because I'm so geeked up? I can't help myself. I wanted to open it up so bad, you know, that <clears throat> I start dropping hints. And she's like, don't tell me, don't tell me. And I just can't help it, right? I mean, I'm like, oh, you're going to love this so much. She's like, oh, I know I will, I know I will. You know, especially when you put it, oh, I didn't say that. Don't tell me, right? But I just, I want her to know these things, right? So I start telling her these little glimpses of what she can expect when she opens up the gift. Because I love her so much and I can't wait to see what's on her face and how she feels when she gets that gift. Have any of you ever done anything dumb like that before, like I'm doing? I mean, any of you ever done that? Okay, those of you that have, 
you understand something about prophecy this morning. You get something very important about the purpose of prophecy. When God started this whole endeavor with people, when creation happened, God wasn't playing in a science project, you know, box and saying, let me just see what happens if I combine the right amino acids. And, oh, look at that. We got life. Isn't that fascinating? Huh, okay. Well, I guess I got a pet. That was not, according to the scriptures, what God was doing. God was very intentional when he created. And when he created humanity specifically, he had a plan. And that plan was for humans and he to be in this wonderful blissful relationship. Now here's the thing, when you and I go and we open up Genesis, and I've told you this for years, and Genesis is not, I don't believe theologically at all, a science book, but it is absolutely a, a, a love letter. It's not a how was it done, it is a why was it done book. And when you get into the why, you see that what God was saying is, I created you to love you. I created you to be in a relationship with me. And when you open up the first couple chapters of Genesis and you start reading about the creative order that happened, when you get to the end of the second chapter, you and I discover and read all about Adam and Eve, the first humans getting life breathed into them. And I completely get because a lot of people that have been to school and seminary feel this way. If you've ever read through from Genesis chapter 2 to Genesis chapter 3, I can completely get how you would just assume that what happens in the last couple verses of Genesis chapter 2 and what happens in the first couple verses of Genesis chapter 3 are just like, bam, bam. Totally would get that. That would seem to make some sense from a historical perspective. But I want to tell you, I personally, and I'm just a junior theologian at best, I believe that there's a pretty good significant period of time that happens when you're looking in your Bible and you go to the last verse of Genesis chapter 2 and the first verse of Genesis chapter 3. I kind of feel like it should be like this. I feel like a good period of time happened for people to be in relationship with the Creator. I think very much that God and Adam and Eve had a good, long, beautiful run of wonder and joy and bliss, where people lived in relationship with God, where they not only knew the fullness of His love, but they also had full knowledge of God. They had full comprehension and full understanding of who He is and what His plan for experience in life was supposed to be about. They got that relationship. But then chapter 3 did happen. And then sin did take place. Selfishness entered into the scenario. The fall of humanity took place there in the Garden of Eden. And when that fall took place, and when selfishness did happen, the darkening of knowledge, the, the breakdown, the separation, the gap between humanity and God did begin at that moment. You could say the chapter of darkness started with chapter 3. And yes, it's true, that chapter of darkness has continued even until this very moment. But God never forgot chapter 2. God never forgot chapter 1. God never forgot what it is that he created us all for in the first place. And God never gave up on the dream of having that separation removed eternally again. And he set about on a wonderful, amazing, incredible plan to redeem humanity because he loves us so much. And the purpose of prophecy is all about giving us glimpses of what is supposed to happen. Because we're still living in the chapter of darkness, it is theologically impossible for any of us to fully grasp again the full knowledge of God. It is impossible for us to fully grasp and understand what all of that stuff is in Revelation without any doubt. But that's okay because what we can grasp are these little hints where God keeps coming along and saying to us, hey, I love you. Hey, I want to give you an in, in, inclination of how this is all going to play out. Hey, I know it's dark, but if you ever do get to the end and you read the last page, you know what it says happens? God wins. It goes 
light again. You see, what the prophecies tell us is that our champion is climbing into the ring to fight the fight, to win the war. It tells us that as much as our adversary, the devil, hates us and hates God and comes after us, that God loves us and is there to save us. And all of the prophecies are there to say, when it gets dark around you and it gets scary, know this, I am your God and I am with you. I've never left and I am working this plan of redemption out. And someday, for anybody, anybody, that would want it. My redemption, Jesus says, will be there to make you whole and to reignite what we never should have lost in the first place. You'll have that again. So don't give up when it gets dark. And I think that's the big scary thing right now. It's not the Bible verses about locust scorpion monsters or attack helicopters that we need to focus on in this series. I can't tell you definitively what they mean, but I can tell you definitively that they are there to tell us that we are loved. They are there to tell us don't give in. They are there to tell us that God has got a plan unveiled for us. Let me share with you as I kind of wrap this all up one more verse from Peter. This comes from the fifth chapter of his first epistle. Peter said, to you and me, these are to us, these words are to us from him, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers and sisters throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong and firm and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. The cool thing about prophecy, gang, and the thing that we're going to see throughout this series is that it's there to teach us it's there for us to study, and when we take it and we let it ourselves be taught by it, when we study it and we let it kind of get inside us and we work it, we, we go ahead and say, you know what, I need to like wake my brain up and get in and, and, and till the soil of it and, and grow and stretch a bit. What we'll see is this message of love coming fresh and anew in our lives again saying, yeah, it's... It's dark outside, and it's scary, and there are things that you need to be paying attention to. There are signs all around that the end is coming, but it is not the end like fire, brimstone, hell, and all that kind of nasty stuff. It is the end of darkness. That Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Father, they are working together to bring about our redemption so that we might once again know the fullness of God and live in the glory of God of his light. And that is the best ending we could possibly ever hope for. Would you pray with me? Father God, thank you so much for what you're going to show us through your prophetic words in the Bible. I pray, Lord God, as we spend the next month or so wrestling with all of this stuff and taking a look at what you have been saying for a long time, uh, not just in Revelation, but in the Old Testament as well, going back and seeing the way you have set about this massive, massive plan to redeem all of us. That, God, I pray that we would be excited to the quick, knowing that um, even the things that are difficult to grasp and understand at this point can be understood, can be grasped against the context of they are glimpses of your love. They are glimpses of your restoration. They are snapshots of what's going to come as you set everything right, as you make it work again, as you redeem us. God, I pray that we would, we would humble ourselves in this regard, that we would say, God, show me what I need to understand. Teach me. Um, let me grasp it new and fresh. Or maybe let me grasp it for the very first time, but let me grasp it, God. Let me grasp what you want to show me so that I might be aware once again of your incredible love for me. 
God, I pray these things in your amazing and holy name. Amen. Man, that was amazing stuff. That was really fantastic. I'm really excited about the next few weeks. Um, so we're going to continue in worship and song, and I want to just kind of introduce a couple songs that we're going to do uh, today. The first one is called Take Me In, and we've, we've uh, sung the chorus of this together. We're going to do the whole thing today, and I really love this song. Uh, what it does is it gives us a physical picture, a representation of the temple in Jerusalem. And Scott, a few weeks ago, uh, if you remember, he talked about when, when Christ died, the, the veil was rent in the temple, right? It was ripped, signifying that we now as people have direct access to God, right? And it, but it w- that was not always the case. Uh, before that, there was a massive process that one had to go through just to be in the presence of the Holy of Holies. And, uh, and again, we, we have direct access to God now since he uh, since Jesus died and rose again but I want to carry with us the weight of what that means that when we sing when we worship when our lives are in worship we are in the very presence of God which is yeah just carrying kind of the weight and just the humility of that for the next few minutes so we're going to sing that song and then we're going to sing a a song called this we know which we've we've done before and I just thought it was really uh, important for us to sing this together as, as Scott introduced the prophecy, uh, the series. And th- the chorus is, this we know we will see the enemy run. This we know we will see his victory come. We hold on to every promise you've ever made. Jesus, you are unfailing. And just as we talk through this with a lot of scary stuff going on right now and more to come, we don't have to be in question of the outcome, like Scott was saying. We know what's going to happen for those that are in Christ. And it is a good, it is the best, the perfect ending. And I was thinking through as well, one of my favorite movies is The Matrix. I don't know if you've seen it before or not. It, I, I've heard sermons on The Matrix. I'm not going to go into like the spiritual parallels or anything like that. I just think it's a really great sci-fi flick. Um, but in the first movie, it's it's a very dark time right there's a lot of you know bad stuff happening and there's a group of people that are searching for the one who is like a savior type figure and there's a conversation between two of the main characters and one says we've done it we've found him and the other character says I hope you're right and the person says you don't have to hope I know it and it's not that we don't hope right I'm not saying that but we don't have to hope that what God says in Scripture, that that perfect ending, we don't have to hope that that's going to happen. We know it. And it was just just really good stuff this morning, man. So um, so let's let's sing. uh, Let's sing together. Take me past the outer courts Into the holy place Past the brazen altar I want to see your face Take me past the crowds of people And priests who sing your praise A hunger and thirst for your righteousness And I've only found one place Take me into the Holy of Holies Take me in by the blood of the Lamb Take me into the Holy of Holies Take the coal, cleanse my lips, here I am Let's sing that together. Take me past the outer courts. Take me past the outer courts. Into the holy place. Past the brazen altar. Lord, I want to see your face. Take me past the crowds of people. And priests that sing your praise. A hunger and thirst for your righteousness. But I've only found one place Take me in to the Holy 
of holies. Take me in by the blood of the Lamb. Take me in to the holy of holies. Take the coal, cleanse my lips. Here I am. Take me in and take me in to the holy. Sing me in by the blood of the Lamb. Sing me in to the Holy of Holies. Take the coal, cleanse my lips, here I am. Take the coal, take the coal, cleanse my lips, here I am. Take the coal. Take the coal, cleanse my lips, here I am. You are who you say you are. You'll do what you say you'll do. You'll be who you've always been to us, Jesus. Our hope is in you alone. Our strength, our strength in your mighty name. Our peace, and our peace in the darkest day remains. Jesus, let's sing this together. We sing this, we know. And this, we know. We will see the enemy run. And this, we know. We will see the victory come. And we hold on to every promise you've ever made. Jesus, you are unfair. guide through the wilderness and our guide through the wilderness our hope in the heaviness and our hope in the heaviness our peace in the darkest day remains Jesus sing this we know and this we know we will see the enemy run, and this we know. We will see the victory come, and we hold on to every promise you've ever made. Jesus, you are unfailing. We sing, we trust you. So we trust you. We trust you, for your ways are higher than our own. So we trust you, we trust you, for your ways are higher than our own. So we trust you, we trust you, we trust you, because you. your ways higher than our own so we trust you we trust forever you. we trust you we trust you Cause your ways are higher than our own and this we know we will see the enemy run and this we know we will see the victory come and we hold on Every promise you've ever made, Jesus, you are unfailing. Lord, this we know, we will see the enemy run. And this we know, we will see the victory come. And we hold on to every promise you've ever made, Jesus, you are 
are unfailing. Yes, Jesus, you are unfailing. Jesus, you, yes, Jesus, you are unfailing. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore, for endless days. We will sing your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. Let's sing that chorus together. Oh, praise the name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name. Forevermore, for endless days, we will sing your praise, O Lord, O Lord our God. Father, we uh, we praise you. We exalt you, we lift you high, Lord. We say that you are the only thing worth our worship. You are sovereign, you are in control of everything that's happening. And God, I just thank you for this this morning, the chance, the opportunity for us to gather together and be in your presence, Lord. Thank you for the truth that we heard through scripture and by your spirit speaking to us and leading us. Amen. Just for a minute. Kind of crazy how Jake and I, did you notice we kind of like matched today? We were sort of twinsing it a little bit, right? Yes, I was glad you wore shorts. Uh, We're wearing shorts because it's nice outside. And it's nice outside because it's spring. And when spring happens... Easter comes, and we're so excited that Easter is, is just around the corner. It's the 17th of April, and what's going to be kind of cool is we're going to, over the next couple of weeks, look at all of the prophecy. You know, obviously, Revelation is what I kind of thought, oh, we'll study Revelation. Then I realized you really need to go further back than that. To really understand what's going on in Revelation, you have to realize that prophecies have been been going for a long time. And the Old Testament's got a bunch of prophecy in it about the Christ. And so we thought, man, this would be so great. So next week, we're going to actually look at uh, the Old Testament prophecies that were alluding to the first coming, which would be such a great setup for us then to, on the 17th, celebrate Easter. So it's going to be so great. And then after that, we'll get into the New Testament prophecy stuff in Revelation. So very excited about this. And you see, this is coming up on April 17th. As you look at the slide, it says it starts Sunday morning at 1030 here at the Lark Venue. And that's true. Boy, someone has got some serious bass going back there at the car wash. Wow. Okay. Poor, poor Tammy and Vera back there are kids right now. Um, I'll make this fast. Anyway, what we were, th- we were thinking about, we, Jeremy and I started and Jake, we've been talking about what will happen, and we thought, you know what would be really cool? Easter is such a great time to really celebrate. I mean, celebrate, right? And a lot of times after church, we want to go celebrate with our families and we want to get out of here really quick, like, which kind of can sort of compromise any sense of community and celebration. So we thought what we would love to do is try to invite everybody to be here early that day. So you too, if you're in Tulsa, we would like you to come to church, come physically to the, to the Lark. And so the festivity, the service will begin at 1030. But at 10 o'clock, we're going to have brunch items set up here. And so we would like to invite you all to come early for church, which means we'll have to set up really fast, uh, make sure everything is all set up and we're all ready and stuff. But come early at 10 o'clock and we'll have you know Easter stuff out. We're going to have a little, you know, 
hide and seek of Easter eggs for the kiddos outside. It's going to be a lot of fun. We'll have all the, the brunch items set out um, so that you can come and fellowship and have community with each other and just kind of get in that celebratory mode as we really get excited about the fact that He is risen and how great that is. So that's coming up on the 17th. I want you to be aware of that. And really, I want to invite you, if you are in Oklahoma and you can make it to Tulsa, and you can make it to South Tulsa here to the Lark, come please in person and be with us because it's much as the Holy Spirit can be anywhere, when He's going to be here in the room with us, the vibe is going to be tremendous together. So I invite you all to be here and be part. We'll still broadcast it online for those of you that can't make it here, but we want to encourage you, be here and let's celebrate together. Okay? It should be really, really a special deal. Thank you so much for being here today. It's been great to worship. I think um, this series is going to be really awesome, so I'm really excited and uh, hope that you will, if you can, be here for every week of it. Okay? Have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.